Hello, lovers of intrigue and investigation. Welcome back to our channel, and especially to our favorite section, La Criminotica. First of all, we want to express our sincere thanks for the incredible support this section has received so far. Your positive response motivates us to continue exploring the darkest corners of the history of crime and justice. Sit back, make yourself comfortable, and get ready for another captivating episode that we're sure will keep you on the edge of your seats. Today we have a heartbreaking story that unravels the dark threads that may be hidden behind inappropriate relationships, toxic family dynamics, and the role guns can play in these tragedies. We immerse ourselves in the investigation of the case of Almudina Marquez, a 13-year-old girl, and Juan Carlos Alfaro, an adult who became obsessed with her until he led her community to a tragic and devastating end. Also, we are excited to share with you that we have been working hard on improving the technical quality of our videos. We hope you'll notice and enjoy the new voice we've added to our channel in an effort to make your experience even more immersive and enjoyable. We remain committed to bringing you the best content possible, and we greatly appreciate your suggestions and feedback. So, without further ado, let's start with the chilling case at hand today. Let's delve into the dark story of Juan Carlos Alfaro and his deadly obsession with the young Almudina Marquez. Juan Carlos Alfaro Aparicio The Fraggle Classification, Killer Characteristics, he killed a 13-year-old girl with whom he claimed to be in love and a 39-year-old man. Number of Victims, 2 Date of Crime, October 21, 2012 Date of Birth, 1973 Profile of the Victim, Almiadina Marquez, 13, and Augustin Delicado, 39 Method of Crime, Firearm Location, El Salabro, Albacete, Spain Status, shot himself on October 22, 2012 Juan Carlos Alfaro, the murderer of a girl and a man in Albacete confessed by phone October 22, 2012 The civil guard continues to search around the Albacete district of El Salabro for Juan Carlos Alfaro, 39 the alleged murderer of a 13-year-old girl, Almudina, and Augustin Delicado, about 40, shot dead yesterday on the half-past seven in the afternoon on Ascencio Street. Another man was slightly injured before the killer, nicknamed El Fraggle in town, fled. The civil guard has spent the night combing the cornfields, villages and farmhouses that surround El Salabro, without success. The man, an Olympic shooting fan and with a weapons license, carries an assault rifle and a pistol with him. The persecution is underway with about 40 members of the Civil Guard. This has explained in a note that the perpetrator of the shots and the minor maintained a consensual sentimental relationship, which led to different complaints crossed with the girl's family. Alfaro shot the girl on Lalu Street. She was the victim he was looking for. After firing her pistol at her and killing her on the spot, he telephoned the civil guard to confess to her crime. Then she fled, returned to his home where he took a long gun and, again, shot and killed Augustin Delicado, 40, an unemployed trucker, who was smoking a cigarette outside the house. Of the While he continued to escape, he ran into the husband of the grandmother of the girl who obsessed him, who he also shot, although with less aim, since he hit him in the shoulder and the outcome was not fatal. In total, a dozen bullet casings have been collected. After the author of the shooting himself notified, the civil guard appeared in the town. After verifying the double crime, the armed institute telephoned the now fled, who answered the mobile and assured that he was not planning to turn himself in. Then the agents have tried to contact him again, but it has not been possible. There was no negative psychological report or restraining order or criminal record. The agents came to have him surrounded in the vicinity of the Lozano gas station in the municipality, but he managed to get away. The accesses to the town are closed and the civil guard and the mayor, Angel Sanchez, 
continue to recommend that residents not leave their homes just in case. Sanchez recounts that during the night they have accompanied many neighbors to their homes frightened by the possibility of meeting the murderer, a 39-year-old mechanic but currently unemployed, and a very skilled person with weapons. The origin of the murders is in a kind of compulsive obsession of Alfaro with her minor, with whom, as the civil guard says, he would maintain a consensual sentimental relationship but with the opposition of her family. According to the residents of the town, the adolescent's family was absolutely opposed to that link, although official sources rule out that a restraining order was requested so that the murderer would not approach Al Medina. According to residents of El Salabro, the harassment of the girl by Alfaran was intense. The minor and her parents did not even want to see him, which could have unleashed Juan Carlos' crazy murderous race through the streets of the district this Saturday. The murderer is also a resident of El Salabro, he lives in his parents' house and is currently unemployed. The minor's mother, very nervous, explained this Sunday that the family had filed several complaints against El Faro. The woman, who has approached a gas station at the entrance to the town, has told the civil guard that the fugitive has a farmhouse in the nearby fields, where she was sure she was hiding. Located about 14 kilometers south of the capital of Albacete, the town is still surrounded by members of the police and the civil guard, who are looking for the murderer among the surrounding cornfields amid the heavy rains that have fallen on the town and have turned the access road is almost impassable. Around 5 in the morning, seven patrol cars stationed at a gas station prevented the entrance to the town, reports Cristobal Manuel. Today the helicopters of the air service of the Civil Guard have joined the raid. While they carried out the search, the agents asked the nearly 1,400 inhabitants of the district to remain in their homes, close the doors and move away from the windows. The assassin was armed with a rifle and a pistol. And behind him he had left two bodies, that of the young Almudina and that of Augustine, and also a seriously wounded person, that of another resident of the town who ran into him in the street when Alfaro was fleeing. Neighbors of Calle Mayor, very close to the scene, heard around half past seven in the evening, quite a few shots and shortly after, screams and crying from relatives of the adolescent. But when we tried to go out to see what was happening and help, the police, who arrived quickly, told us to stay in our houses, a neighbor described in a telephone conversation. I am a sniper and I will kill you all to stay with her. October 22, 2012 She has blown it up. With four shots, she's blown it up. To my girl. I knew this was going to happen and I said so. I said it and nobody listened to me. Now it's late. I don't want anyone's tears, from any of those who laughed thanks to the murderer, from any of those who saw what was happening and did nothing. From no one. Only I and those I want are going to bury my daughter. Adela, the mother of Almudina, the 13-year-old girl murdered on Saturday in the Albacete district of El Salabro, is torn. At the Forensic Anatomical Institute of the Nuestra Senora del Perpetuo Socorro Hospital, where she awaited the autopsy of her daughter, the terrible cries of pain had not only to do with death, but also with impotence. She and the rest of the family knew that a 39-year-old madman had become obsessed with the little girl and that she could be dangerous. It happened on Saturday. Juan Carlos Alfaro Aparicio, an unemployed mechanic, known as El Fraggle, an expert shooter, he had a 9mm parabellum pistol among his weapons dash, picked up a pistol and went out to kill Almudina, with whom, according to what he said, he was in love. She was walking with some friends through the center of El Salabro, a district with just over 1,000 inhabitants 14 kilometers from Albacete, when Juan Carlos came up to her. It was 7.20 in the afternoon, more or less. He fired four shots at her with his pistol in a small alley and left in the direction of her house, according to neighbors. He called 911 and informed them that he had killed the teenager. Later, he entered her house, in one of the corners of the Plaza Mayor, in front of the church, and picked up a rifle. With it in hand, 
she headed for Main Street and fired a flurry of shots forward. Up to 15 bullet holes can still be seen in the buildings in the background. One of them caught up with a neighbor who had come out to smoke on the porch of his house. It was Augustin Delicato, 40, known as Pepsicolo, an unemployed trucker with an 11-year-old girl. Death found him talking to his neighbor, Francisco Martinez. We hardly even saw him, he says. We were talking quietly across from each other when we heard the shots. When I looked, Unhel was on the ground. Coincidentally, Almudina's grandmother's husband was driving into the car at that moment on Calle Mayor. He too was hit by one of the shots, but he was luckier than Delicado. He was slightly injured in the arm and was released early Saturday morning. Almudina lived with him and his wife. Yesterday he was waiting in shock at the hospital mortuary, with his arm in a sling, along with his wife and Almudina's mother. Alfaro ran away. Since then, he has not appeared. The civil guard believes that he fled on foot. He did not do it, of course, neither in his car nor on his motorcycle, the agents have both controlled Dash, although they cannot ensure that he did not use a friend's vehicle to flee. The night of the two murders was dark and pouring with rain, making it easy for him to hide and escape. The agents called him on the phone to try to get him to turn himself in. They talked to him, but to no avail. At 11 o'clock at night he disconnected his cell phone. There he loses track of him. He is armed with a rifle and a pistol and is an excellent shot. Yesterday the search was especially careful in the area where he supposedly spoke on the phone for the last time, but they could not find him. The extensive deployment of the civil guard, who searched for him tirelessly with more than 40 troops, dogs and a helicopter, in a device led by Lt. Col. Pedro Blanco, has not been successful so far. They have combed farms, farms, abandoned corrals, warehouses. El Salabral is a district surrounded by farmhouses, cornfields that in some points reach up to 3 meters and dirt roads that the murderer knows perfectly well and where it is easy to hide. Some neighbors wonder if he has not shot himself and will find him, after a few months, when the combines begin to cut the corn. So it happened, they say, with a man who committed suicide some time ago. But most believe that Alfaro is still alive and that he will appear sooner or later. Almedina's family assures that it is the chronicle of a death foretold, that they had filed complaints with the civil guard and the national police asking that Alfaro get away from his daughter, and that no one has helped them. Sources from the Armed Institute confirm that there were complaints, one with the police and another three with the civil guard since February. But, in turn, the murderer had also filed three complaints against the mother and the family. The same sources indicate that the complaints were given the corresponding course. They clarify that most were due to threats and that in the only case in which the family mentioned a relationship between Alfaro and the girl, they were transferred to the juvenile prosecutor's office. Almedina started seeing Alfaro two years ago. She was then 11 years old. He, 37. She was a very rock girl, she liked music a lot, and he cajoled her on that side, recalls Jose, a cousin of the victim's grandmother. He would take her home and they would listen to records. Little by little, Alfaro became obsessed with the girl, according to her family, until he went completely crazy. He said that he was in love with her, that he wanted to be with her, protect her from the world, says Jose. And he looks at how he has protected her. The miner's mother and grandmother did not want Alfaro to see her little girl. From the beginning they considered this obsession of man as something pathological. They talked with him, with his family. But it was no use. At one point, he began to threaten them, I'm a sniper and I'm going to kill you all to stay with her, he told Almudina's mother, according to Jose's account. I was going to look for her at school, to wait for her under her house, he was totally deranged, explains another family friend. And she did not always go well. 
He sometimes called her a whore and a slut in front of her schoolmates. A dark point is how far the girl was willing to maintain a relationship with him. Some of the people close to her maintain that he seemed harmless to her, that she wanted to be with him, that she sometimes ran away from her to see him and that she even wrote him letters that she later sent him through a friend from she. Others say that this was so but that she did not want to see him anymore. The family assures that, when they reported, they were told that if there were no signs of sexual abuse and she wanted to see him, there was not much they could do. Adela, her mother, confronted him recently and he filed a complaint against her for death threats. Everything was the same for her, says a friend who is waiting for the autopsy. She just wanted to protect her daughter. She was afraid. And, seen what has been seen, also right. Most of the neighbors who were on the street yesterday say that Alfaro's parents are normal, simple people, but that their children lead a strange life. Two of the murderer's brothers, according to the account of at least six neighbors, never leave the house. They wear long robes and a huge beard and are only sometimes seen leaning out on the terrace at night. Alfaro, according to the same versions, also spent some time in jail. But now he was leaving. And he said that he wanted to spend as much time as possible without Medina. The murderer of El Salabral commits suicide after the siege of the Civil Guard. October 22, 2012 Juan Carlos Alfaro, the alleged murderer who killed a 13-year-old girl last Saturday in El Salabral, with whom he claimed to be in love, and another resident of the town of Albacete, has committed suicide at the door of the booth where he had been entrenched since early this morning after being discovered by the civil guard. The 39-year-old alleged murderer, who was armed with a rifle and a pistol and was an excellent shot, left the booth around 3 in the afternoon and shot himself in the head after enduring a fence of about 6 hours. Although the man lost his pulse and was thought to have died during the helicopter transfer to the Albacete Hospital, health personnel from the hospital managed to revive him upon arrival there and maintain his vital signs because he was an organ donor until his death, certified by 18.30. The Civil Guard, after a day and a half of searching, had located him around 9 in the morning in an area near a farm belonging to his family. From that moment on, the agents tried to convince him to turn himself in peacefully. Other relatives, including some very close uncles, moved to the area and also asked to speak with him. During the time he was surrounded, Alfaro assured that he would not shoot if the agents did not fire at him. At mid-morning he asked for tobacco and a mobile phone to better communicate with the security forces, after his battery ran out. A hundred members of the security forces and the information service of the Albacete Command surrounded the place where he was entrenched, inside a booth in the area that the mother of the minor had indicated to the police as a possible hiding place for the alleged murderer. Near these lands the Alfaro family owns a farm and also one of the brothers of Augustin Delicato, the neighbor whom he allegedly killed on Saturday. The civil guard requested the assistance of a medicalized UV in case there were injuries. Until Alfaro was located this morning, the agents, with the help of dogs and a helicopter, combed every square meter around the Albacete district since Saturday, after Alfaro fled after committing his crime. The burial of the minor took place at 3 p.m. in the Albacete Cemetery and that of Augustin Delicato at 5 p.m. in El Salabro. The crime occurred on Saturday afternoon. The alleged murderer, an unemployed mechanic, known as El Fraggle, an expert shooter and with 15 weapons at home, took a pistol and went out to kill Al Medina. She was walking with some friends through the center of El Salabro, a small district with just over 1,000 inhabitants 14 kilometers from Albacete, when Alfaro came up to her. It was 7.20 in the afternoon, more or less. She fired four shots at him on Calle La Luz, a small alley, and ran off in the direction of her house, according to the versions of the neighbors. At that time, she called the emergency service and informed them that he had killed the teenager. She then went into her house, in one of the corners of the Plaza Mayor, in front of the town church, and picked up a rifle. 
With this in hand, he headed for Main Street and fired a flurry of shots forward. Up to 15 bullet holes can still be seen in the buildings. One of them caught up with a neighbor who had gone out on the porch of his house to smoke a cigarette so as not to disturb. It was Augustin Delicato, 40, known as Pepsicolo, an unemployed trucker with an 11-year-old girl. He died instantly. At that moment, his neighbor, Francisco Martinez, was talking to him. We hardly even saw him, he says. We were talking quietly across from each other when we started hearing the shots. When I looked, Augustin was on the ground. Coincidentally, Almudina's grandmother's husband was getting into a car at that moment on Calle Mayor. He too was hit by one of the shots, but he was luckier than Delicado. He was slightly injured in the arm and was released early Saturday morning. Almudina lived with him and his wife. On Sunday he waited in shock for Almudina's body in the hospital mortuary, with his arm in a sling, along with his wife and Almudina's mother. Alfaro ran away. The civil guard believes that he fled on foot. He did not do it, of course, neither in his car nor on his motorcycle, the agents had both controlled Dash, although they cannot ensure that he did not use a friend's vehicle to flee. The night of the two murders was dark and pouring with rain, making it easy for her to hide and escape. The agents called him on the phone to try to get him to turn himself in. They talked to him, but to no avail. At 11 o'clock at night he disconnected the phone. There he lost track of him. On Sunday the search was especially careful in the area where he supposedly spoke on his cell phone for the last time, but they have not been able to find him until this morning. Alfaro sowed panic in the town. After the triple attack, the civil guard closed the accesses to El Salabro and recommended that all residents not leave their homes. Some of them, afraid that the murderer could appear on any street, asked the agents to accompany them home, as explained by the mayor, Angel Sanchez. The Ministry of Education has suspended classes this Monday at the El Salabro School and at the IES de Aguas Nuevas, Albacete, where the murdered minor was studying. The one who ran away to nowhere. October 23, 2012. It was a strange funeral for Juan Carlos Alfaro. The priest asked God to seek the good that he had done and to forgive him for the sins committed. The sins were on the minds of everyone in attendance, two homicides. Those words were also pronounced in the same room of the Albacete funeral home where the same priest had officiated a funeral for Almudina Marquez, the 13-year-old girl murdered on Saturday by Alfaro the day before. The priest's readings reflected some bewilderment over the chain of funerals, Alfaro's second victim, a 40-year-old resident of the town, Augustin Delicato, was also buried on Monday Dash, and yesterday's was the most difficult. It wasn't the victims who had to be fired, but the one he'd taken up and then killed himself. The religious chose to focus on the pain of the family and the need for normalcy to return to El Salabro. Alfaro's body will be cremated, not buried, at the wish of the family, which will prevent the production of an image that nobody wanted, the coffins of Almudina and Augustin, the two victims, next to the one who killed them in the small Salabro cemetery. In the town, meanwhile, they continue talking about what Alfaro was like and what he could have happened to him. He was a great shot, of that there is no doubt. With a gun, he hit a target a mile away and was able to go through a tall glass even when he was far away, according to local reports. Shooting, hunting and motorcycles were his great hobby. The person in charge of one of the restaurants in the town assures that he liked weapons so much that he bought some old and unused ones at auctions and restored them. He even talks about a rifle. His uncle Francisco de L points out that hunting was his great hobby, his hobby, and that is why he accumulated so many weapons. Alfaro's biography is confusing. In a small town like El Salabro, the rumors are endless. So much so that it is often difficult to know if something happened exactly as it has spread through the town or not. It is true that he was a fairly normal boy, 
that as a teenager he had friends who considered him outgoing and cheerful, and that at some point people in the town began to observe strange behavior. He hung out a lot with young people and adolescents, not only with Al Medina, despite being almost 40 years old, and he spent some seasons very cooped up at home although not as much as his brothers, who attended the funeral yesterday with his sister and their parents. It seems that he spent some time in Canada after becoming unemployed before he worked in a relative's workshop in Albacete, but he returned a few months later. Since then, he botched motorcycles when he could and lived with his parents. After committing the two murders, on Saturday, he returned to the place he knows best, the field. The civil guard does not know exactly where he initially took refuge, but they do know that he did not go to his family's booth where he was finally found early on Sunday, about a kilometer and a half from El Salabro. It was one of the first places that the civil guard went to. They looked everywhere for him, but he was not there. Despite this, and just in case, they left permanent surveillance in place. Around 11 p.m. on Sunday, the agents who were there saw the silhouette of a person approaching the booth. When he saw the car, he turned around. They searched for it with flashlights for an hour, but then decided to wait until the next day. Alfaro knew the area very well, it was dark, he was armed and dangerous. The next morning they began the search again. One of the officers saw a broken window in the booth, it hadn't been broken the night before, and approached it. There he saw Alfaro, who, apparently, was also surprised to see him. There was contradictory information at that time, but, in contrast to what the civil guard itself reported at that time, it was finally verified that there had been no exchange of shots, according to Captain Juan Manuel Burgos. From that moment on, the Special Intervention Unit was called to begin negotiations. The booth where everything happened, along with another slightly larger one also belonging to the family, was closed yesterday. In the one next to it, through the window you can see a gym perfectly set up with punching bags, bikes and a martial arts board. In the patio there are numerous targets with shots. The material with which they had tried to revive Alfaro after he shot himself was still there. There were gauze pads, latex gloves, and syringes along with a black sock, a beige Nike shoe, and a large pool of blood. According to the civil guard, Alfaro, after six hours in which they tried to negotiate with him to turn himself in, came out with the gun to his temple, walked about 100 meters and shot himself. You are sad, wanting to be with a 13-year-old girl like me. October 23, 2012 while the priest was saying goodbye to Almudina in the Albacete funeral home due to the inconsolable heartbreak of his mother and grandmother, some 15 kilometers away, at that precise moment, after 3 in the afternoon, Juan Carlos Alfaro left the booth where he had been carrying several entrenched for hours and shot himself in the head. The efforts of the civil guard to try to convince him, for several hours and speaking with him through a mobile phone, to turn himself in peacefully were useless. Two days had passed since he shot dead the 13-year-old miner, with whom he claimed to be in love, and another resident of the town, Augustin Delicato, 40, who was hit by a burst of shots at the door of his house. He had just gone out to smoke a cigarette. Alfaro, 39, did not die instantly. The shot to his head left him clinically dead, but he was maintaining vital signs. He was taken by helicopter to the Albacete General Hospital, where he died at 6.30 p.m. At that same time, the Albacete district of El Salabral had just buried Delicado after dozens of neighbors walked the path from the church to the cemetery with the coffin. His body rests next to Almudinas, who was buried two hours earlier. The two families had watched together the bodies of both victims throughout the previous night. The civil guard had searched for Alfaro tirelessly throughout the area, surrounded by tall cornfields, since Saturday. It was then that, around half past seven, he shot Almudina, entered the house where he lived with his parents and siblings, picked up a rifle, went out again, and fired a burst of shots on Calle Mayor in El Salabro. 
The shots hit his second victim, Delicato, and the husband of Almudina's grandmother, who was in his car and was wounded in the shoulder. Then he fled. They found him yesterday morning in the place where Almudina's mother, Adela, was convinced that she was hiding, some land owned by her family located in front of the town where they had a booth. Once discovered, he entrenched himself there for hours. He asked for tobacco and a mobile phone with which to continue talking with the civil guard, the special intervention unit was in charge of the negotiation. His own father, Antonio, participated in the intervention trying to convince his son to turn himself in. But it was all in vain. Alfaro ended up taking his own life. The shocked residents of El Salabral have spent two days trying to build an account of what happened, a story that is difficult to make sense of and in which the only certain thing was that Alfaro and little Almudina had had some kind of relationship at some point with the girl's consent, that he had become obsessed. That the girl's mother and grandmother were strongly opposed to that link, and that he had said that he would be with her whether they wanted it or not and that he could kill them if they opposed, according to the story of her cousin and one of Almudina's grandmother's best friends, Jose. But the girl, who began to treat him about two years ago, when she was eleven, and consented, was no longer so sure if she wanted to continue with him, something that Alfaro did not accept. Sometimes he would come to look for her at school and insult her when she told him to leave her alone, recalls one of her classmates. The girl witnessed, a month or so ago, the following conversation between the two. I brought you a gift, a necklace. Take. I do not want it. For you. You're just as bitchy as your mother. And you are sad with a 13-year-old girl like me. That day, she had painted her eyes, and he didn't like it, says another classmate. She had started to change. Before she was a very lonely girl, she used to go out with her dog alone and listen to her music. She was dressed in dark clothes, like heavy. But now she was much more sociable. The other day I even saw her in a white sweatshirt, something she didn't do before. I think she had realized that what was happening with that man was not normal. He was 26 years older than her. Eventually, everything seemed to be going a little better. The girl had begun to go to a psychologist from the social services, says Jose, the close friend of her grandmother. But, just when some help arrived, this happens. The family is devastated. They knew that none of this was normal and that is why they had denounced it. But nobody paid attention to them because it was supposedly spoiled. I don't know how an adult relationship with such a small girl can be consented to. Alfaro's fights with the Almudina family were constant. They got to talk to his mother, Candida, who told them that they were not doing anything wrong, that they were in love and that the difference in age was not that important. According to Almudina's family, Candida told them that she did not want the same thing to happen to Juan Carlos as to his other two children, who never go out, Juan Carlos himself had also spent some time locked up Dash. Alfaro's mother declared yesterday to two television stations that the pressure suffered by her son from Almudina's family was such that perhaps that is why she had acted like this. Alfaro, in any case, it seems that he did not accept Almudina's decision not to continue with him. That's why he kept looking for her and chasing her. Maybe that's why he killed her. The victim's family environment laments that no one in the town took seriously the threat posed by a 39-year-old man obsessed with a 13-year-old girl and who was also a lover of weapons. In front of me, Adela called the sergeant of the civil guard to tell him that she had a weapon in the car and that she could do anything, explains a friend of Almudina's mother shortly after the girl's burial. But of course, since she had a license, and legal weapons, and everyone thought that the matter was an exaggeration, they did not pay attention to her. I think only the family realized how crazy this man was and what he was capable of. Unfortunately, they were right. The faces of Almudina's mother and her grandmother, who did not stop hugging the photo of her granddaughter, with the image overturned on her lap, reflected indescribable pain. 
The young woman from El Salabro, whether you want it or not, I still love Juan Carlos Alfaro Aparicio. October 23, 2012 You are sad wanting to be with a 13-year-old girl like me, were the words of Almudena, the 13-year-old girl who was murdered by Juan Carlos Alfaro Aparicio, alias El Fraggle, in El Salabro, Albacete, in a network social. But she wasn't the only one she posted on her Facebook board. A she never knows what fate has in store for her, said the young woman. In this same network and under the alias of darkness, the 13-year-old girl made various and profound reflections. Thus, in 2011 she wrote, aggression is a symptom of mental weakness. And on April 7th she added, Yaya, there is no Jose, whether you like it or not, I still love Juan Carlos Alfaro Aparicio, the person who a few months later took her life. El Salabro has been trying for days to try to build a story of everything that happened in relation to a marriage not consented to by the mother and grandmother of the minor, since the perpetrator of the crime had said that he would be with her whether they wanted it or not and that he could kill them if they resisted. Escapes and commits suicide. After having committed the murder, Alfaro flees and is found in the place where Almudina's mother was convinced that he was hiding, some land owned by her family. After being discovered, he asked for tobacco and a mobile phone to continue talking with the civil guard. Despite the fact that his own father tried to convince him to turn himself in, Alfaro ended up taking his own life. Back to normal. The mayor of El Salabro, Angel Sanchez, trusts that, little by little, the town will return to normality after the events that occurred since last Saturday with the double crime and the death yesterday of the alleged perpetrator, Juan Carlos Alfaro, El Frago. In statements, the village mayor hopes that El Salabro, with about 1,500 inhabitants, will return to normality and that there will be no confrontations between the families of the victims and that of Alfaro, since they are all peaceful. After two turbulent days in the district, El Salabro woke up today, calmer, after El Fraggle died yesterday afternoon after shooting himself in the head with a pistol. A civil guard patrol discreetly monitors the town today to control the psychosis of the people, but nothing to do with the deployment that has taken place in the last three days, according to the counselor. What remains behind the anger? October 28, 2012 What's happening? You'll find out. Rifle in hand, Juan Carlos Alfaro found himself in the streets of El Salabro with at least two neighbors whom he greeted. One was on foot and another was returning by bicycle from the orchard. He was 39 years old and had just murdered a 13-year-old girl whom he claimed to love. In his flight, he did not shoot everyone in his path. Only two more people, the husband of the girl's grandmother, who was injured, and another resident of the town, who died on the spot. The reasons for this last crime he took to the grave, but his sick obsession with the girl came from afar. It was, it seems, a planned massacre. He wanted to kill all those who opposed what he considered love. It was the beginning of the end of a story that began years ago, in some country houses located opposite the town, on the way to the hills near El Salabro. Candida Aparicio and Antonio Alfaro have some booths there. His son Juan Carlos liked to spend long periods of time on his land. He felt good in the open air. He walked, went out with the dogs, exercised. In one of the houses he set up a gym with bikes, punching bags, weights, a martial arts table and all kinds of equipment. But most of all, he did target practice almost daily. He had many targets, weapons, and a great aim. He also liked hunting. They say in the town that if he saw a partridge, no matter what the distance, he would shoot it down for sure. He was a friend of Augustin Delicato, another resident of El Salabro. They were more or less the same age. Juan Carlos, the Fraggle, was 39 years old, Augustin, the Pepsicolo, 40. One was a mechanic, the other, trucker. Both were unemployed. 
Juan Carlos went every afternoon at half past three, after eating, to have coffee at Port Dry, the bar of one of Augustine's brothers. On the hill, he was a neighbor of another of them, whom he greeted every morning while he did his target practice. The two families had known each other their entire lives and they seemed to get along well. Augustine was the second fatality of Juan Carlos on Saturday, October 20th. He was shot dead at the door of his house. Juan Carlos had fired a burst of at least 15 shots in the direction of his door at the moment when Augustine went out to smoke a cigarette. Before, he had shot Almudina, the 13-year-old girl with whom he was obsessed, with a pistol. Both victims died instantly. After killing the girl, he called 911 and confessed to the crime. In his flight towards the cornfields, he also met Almudina's step-grandfather, who was driving a car, very nervous because he had already seen the lifeless body of his granddaughter. He shot her and hit her shoulder. Later, and after calling a couple of people dash one of them passed the phone directly to the civil guard agent's dash, he hid in the field for a day and a half. We heard a very strong firecracker, Pilar recalls of the tragic afternoon. I thought they were firecrackers. My husband came out to look. That they have killed the Almudina, Pilar, they have killed the Almudina, he told me when he returned. To us she was like a granddaughter. That same morning she had come to greet me and give me a kiss. She was very affectionate. A few meters from there, in Port Dry, Pepe, Augustine's brother, was celebrating the birthday of one of his sons at the bar. There were seven or eight kids, among them, Augustine's eleven-year-old daughter and a friend of Almedina's. They also heard the discharge. When I went out, I saw a fire at the end of the street, says Pepe. I thought it was in my parents' portal. I ran out and found my brother on the ground. Dead. He lived there with my parents and my sister. We didn't tell his daughter, who is with her mother in Albacete during the week, until the next day. I stayed in the bar with the kids, says his wife. The civil guard entered and said that everything should be closed. We turned off the lights and hid. Fear and confusion took over El Salabro for hours. The story of Juan Carlos and Almudina began to spread like wildfire. Everyone thought that the next could be the girl's mother and grandmother. Another boy, Mariano, whom Juan Carlos had asked in a threatening tone those days why Almudina had gotten into his car, hid in the bakery in terror. He didn't come out until two days later. He thought that he could be the next in the murderous revenge of Juan Carlos. On Monday, six hours after the civil guard found him in his parents' country house, the one he liked so much, Juan Carlos shot himself. He left the house, walked straight ahead with a gun to his temple, and fired. It was just after three in the afternoon. At the same time that the priest Pascual Guerrero was officiating a funeral with the body present to say goodbye to Almudina, Juan Carlos committed suicide in the place where his obsessive and strange relationship with a girl 26 years his junior had begun. Almudina had a biological father who never took care of her. Her mother, Adela, had a relationship for almost eight years with another boy from the town, Jose Andres who welcomed and loved the little girl as if she were his daughter. Jose Andres's family had a house on the hill, next to the Alfaro's land, and they went there very often. Almudina loved dogs and nature. Sightseeing. She there she was calm. And there she began to treat her neighbor Juan Carlos as hers. Almudina's mother, Adela, separated from Jose Andres. But the girl continued to see who she already considered her father, and her grandparents, Pilar and Andres. She continued going to the hill and seeing Juan Carlos. At first they began to share hobbies. To listen to rock and heavy metal music, to talk, to take walks. Almudina, a loving but lonely girl, was 11 years old when she started spending more time with him. Fraggle, 37. 
Those who treated them say that at that time there was no love relationship between them, that this began very little by little and that they began their kind of courtship a little less than a year ago. No one is very clear about how far that bond went, physically and sexually. The relationship between the two grew closer until it became something that no one understood. They no longer saw each other only on the hill, but also in the town. She went to her house to listen to music and sometimes walked with him through El Salabro, although never holding hands or holding hands, according to several neighbors. In fact, many in the town were unaware that there was anything between the fraggle and the girl and they did not find out until the night of the double crime. How could he pretend to have a 13-year-old girlfriend, they asked themselves now in El Salabro. He faced those who, like Augustin Delicato last summer and other acquaintances, once reproached him for what they understood as an unacceptable obsession. Augustin told him to go together to meet full-fledged women. Juan Carlos got angry. He said that he would wait until Almedina was older, that he loved her. Some attribute Augustine's crime to these criticisms. Others, because Juan Carlos thought that his nephew, Jose, was fooling around with the girl. There are different theories, but all recognize that they are conjectures. The motive for this murder is still very unclear. Almedina's family believed from the beginning that her relationship with Juan Carlos was pathological, sick, and unequal. A story that should not be. An aberration. The girl's grandmother, Francisca, had also had a bad experience with her first husband and the father of her children, whom she also met as a teenager. The girl now lived with her and with her husband. The mother, Adela, lived in El Pasico, a tiny village between El Salabro and Aguas Nuevas, along with her new partner. Neither the mother nor the grandmother intended to allow the relationship to continue in any way. Juan Carlos's family also thought that it was not the best thing for his son, but they did not oppose it with the same intensity. They considered it inevitable. They said that they both wanted to be together, and that he was crazy about her. Juan Carlos, a very intelligent boy, according to the neighbors, locked himself up at home for a few seasons, but went out. A couple of years ago he went to Canada to look for a job as a mechanic, but he ended up coming back. His two brothers, only his sister lives outside of El Salabro, with her partner barely set foot on the street. There are those who had not seen the eldest, Antonio, leave the house for more than 20 years. Since his classmates went to serve in the military, says a neighbor. Juan Carlos had things about him, he was a very nervous boy, but he was more integrated into the town, although he went with a rather conflictive gang. He was totally devoted to shooting and hunting. He had three weapons licenses, E for sport shooting weapons and hunting shotguns, the D for large game long arms, and F for short and long weapons for sporting use. The latter allowed him to have a pistol like the one he bought in an armory in Albacete the Thursday before he committed the murders. Everything was legal. In total, according to the civil guard, he had three or four weapons. The neighbors assure that he also bought old and unused collector's items at auction, and that some managed to fix them. The conflict between Juan Carlos and Almedina's family began to grow during the last nine months until it led to threats and mutual complaints. Juan Carlos's entourage considered that they were going too far and that they had no right to put so much pressure on him if the relationship was consensual. The mother and grandmother did not understand that they did not realize the seriousness of the situation, and that they were facing abuse by an almost 40-year-old adult on a 13-year-old girl. The girl said that she loved him too. His mother and her grandmother thought she had sucked his brains out. They took her mobile phone from her, they almost didn't let her leave the house or use the internet. She wrote about her love on her Facebook wall and sent her letters through her friends. He was going to look for her at the institute. He would take her on a motorcycle to the countryside, to the hill. The mother assures that she denounced him many times. 
The captain of the civil guard Juan Manuel Burgos says that they only know of one, of which they informed the court and the juvenile prosecutor's office no measure was ever adopted dash. And that on another occasion they intervened ex officio due to a fight between Juan Carlos and the Almedina family. There was another complaint before the national police. Almedina had recently ended the relationship, according to some of her high school classmates, who witnessed insults and threats from him. Juan Carlos's parents claim that he was the one who cut the story short, but at the same time they admit that he couldn't even stand another man driving her somewhere. Adela, Jose Andres, Francisca, her husband, all the relatives of the girl had told Juan Carlos, by hook or by crook, to stay away from the little girl, and he thought it was their fault that he no longer could be seen. He also feared being denounced for sexual abuse or rape by her or her family. A friend of Almedina's mother says that lately they were very afraid because of what was happening, they thought that she could kill them or the girl. Juan Carlos bought a new pistol on Thursday and, around 7 in the afternoon on Saturday, he killed Almedina. He ended the very short life of what he said was the love of her life. Either she was with him or she was with no one. A sexist crime. The 38th victim this year according to the government count. The youngest. In El Salabro, the residents remember accidents, suicides, fights, but no trauma as profound as that of that weekend. The double crime has surpassed them. From now on we are going to be like Porta Haraco, right? Says a neighbor while having a beer. Nobody is going to know us for the potatoes anymore, but for the murders. It is an agricultural town dedicated mainly to planting this tuber and cereal, corn, wheat, barley, alfalfa. A very small site. So much so that it is not even a town. It is a district of Albacete with about 1,400 inhabitants. It has a school, a tobacconist, a church, three restaurants, a hostel, three supermarkets, a gas station. Basic services for a tiny population. They all know each other. And many are close or distant family. You don't have to stir the shit, you hear these days. The neighbors ask for tranquility to continue living. Many think that the fact that the murderer took his own life makes things easier. If Juan Carlos had been arrested, if he had gone to jail, if his relatives had gone to see him, everything would have been more complicated in the town. But, now, the three families have suffered a tragedy. A mother and a grandmother have lost their daughter, Almudina, an 11-year-old daughter has lost her father, Augustine, and a father and a mother will have to live with the burden of knowing that his son killed two people before committing suicide. It shouldn't be easy for them either, say Pepe and Desiderio, Augustine's two brothers. A cousin of Pepe has apologized. He was also a cousin of Juan Carlos. He told me that he was very sorry, that he did not understand how a cousin of his had committed such a crime, says Pepe. We gave each other a hug. What are we going to do? Tomorrow I'll talk to another of my cousins, I know he's the same and he doesn't even dare to come. These wounds must be closed. Juan Carlos's mother, Candida, is the niece of an uncle of the Delicados. We are family, says Pepe. He trusted that we will get through it, although I understand that for the girl's family it will be much more difficult. The girl's mother, Adela, was at her house in El Pasico on Thursday. Her partner asks the journalist, please, to leave. Is very bad. It's not fit. She spoke on the day of the funeral and now tries to come to terms with what happened. His ex-boyfriend, Jose Andres, puts out beers, with a contorted face, in the diner where he works. How are you? asks the priest. Worse than bad, he replies. On La Luz Street, where Almudina died, the children leave flowers and candles. They have made an altar. We will never forget you, they write to him. They have placed a photo of Almudina smiling on a horse. 
The mayor, Unhel, says that these days there are still scared children who cannot sleep alone. El Fraggle, the hunter who harassed his prey. October 29, 2012. Before they accuse me of being a pedophile, I mount it. I make a massacre. It is a confidence from Juan Carlos Alfaro Aparicio to a friend of his, a minor, last Thursday, two days before he went out on a hunt and killed Almudina Marquez, 13, and Augustin Delicado, 39, on the spot, in the small Albacete town of El Salabro. That Thursday, Juan Carlos, a great fan of weapons and hunting, had received a pistol purchased in a gun shop, a 9mm Walther with which he shot the girl, and had gone to test it with his friend. He felt cornered by the family of the minor, with whom he had become engaged in May of the previous year, and he felt despised by the girl, who no longer wanted to continue with him, despite her insistence. It had been a bad week. On Tuesday, Almudina's mother, Adela Marquez, stopped him in the street, son of a bitch, I have to kill you, wretch, she insulted him in front of several witnesses. And she then kicked her car out of her diwu and dented the left rear door. Juan Carlos denounced her mother at the Aguas Nueva Civil Guard post and said that the woman did not want her daughter to be with him, in her testimony she talks about the relationship in the past tense. It was not the first time that complaints were exchanged between the two adults, with the girl at the center of the enmity and a love relationship in which 26 years of maturity and life span. Adela, who did not live with her daughter, but the girl lived with her grandmother and her partner, went to the civil guard in February of this year for the first time. There she showed her concern for the courtship consented to by the girl, she explained that she did not know if her daughter had sexual relations with Alfaro, and she denied that he harassed or forced her. Social Networks A 39-year-old individual who is related to a 13-year-old girl has clear affective problems. There is a gap between cognitive and emotional maturity. These types of people usually have interpersonal relationship problems due to high insecurity and a clear ambivalence in their relationships, together with a lack of self-acceptance, analyzes Maria del Rocio Gomez Hermoso, a forensic psychologist at the Madrid Penitentiary Surveillance Courts. And graduated in law, after establishing the premise that this diagnosis is not based on a direct psychological evaluation, for obvious reasons. Months passed from the first complaint and the relationship continued. Almedina, with a false identity but a real photograph, aired it on social networks and secreted about it with her friends. She wrote about her love, her outlook on life and her shared love of heavy music. On July 10, the girl's mother went to the Albacete police station and charged Alfaro again. She denounces that she is afraid that her daughter will run away from her grandparents' house. She reports that she lies to them about the places she goes to, she suspects that the adult, almost his age, is about to blow up the family clan. Adela guessed the problems. At the end of August, she threatens Alfaro again and he reports her to the police. Two days later the girl did not go to her house to sleep. That morning the agents were again required. Almedina's grandmother told them that the baby had escaped through the window and that she was with Juan Carlos. She was not wrong. She did not want to leave, she insisted that she was there because she wanted to, but shortly after the minor returned with the guards to her home. The civil guard reiterates that it brought these complaints to the attention of the juvenile prosecutor's office and that a court decided to dismiss them because it did not appreciate any crime. They reject the criticisms that have splashed them in recent days. We fulfill our obligation, insists a spokesman. On Monday the 15th, one day before the incident in the car with Adela Marquez, another resident of the town, Arturo Mas, also denounced Juan Carlos Alfaro. He told the agents that he had insulted his daughter Ana Bolin, a friend of Almudina's, because she refused to act as an errant boy and matchmaker for the spiteful boyfriend. He called her a clown, idiot and wretch. That girl, one of her best friends, 
was the one who accompanied the victim the night her ex-boyfriend broke up with her because he had abandoned him. Anna Bolin later recounted that the attacker stopped her car next to them and asked the victim to get in. The baby refused and there were no more words, only the shots that ended her life on the spot. She, Anna Bolin, the one who fulfilled the wishes of her friend, was let go. Like a doll. Juan Carlos Alfaro, whom everyone defines as normal in El Salabro, was known for his passion for weapons, he had an automatic pistol, an assault rifle and two rifles, hunting and motorcycles. He was 39 years old, but perhaps only in the DNI. The effective immaturity seems clear. If he felt comfortable with a 13-year-old girl, it was because of his identification and his ability to control. And they are not incompatible. He could handle her like a doll, says the forensic psychiatrist Jose Miguel Gaona. This expert goes further and considers that devotion to weapons can be included in this package of insecurity need for control. He needs powerful extensions to feel safe. For Gaona, it is not impossible that Alfaro suffered from a personality disorder, but no one had diagnosed him. The psychologist Rocio Gomez, on the other hand, attributes this passion for shooting more to a cultural factor, linked to rural areas. The truth is that the unemployed hunter, who dedicated himself to mechanical tinkering and thundered the streets with his motorcycle, was more than fond of hunting and his true folly was practicing shooting. The Strange Family He is clearly aware of his behavior and its effects, despite his lack of personal fulfillment, analyzes Rocio Gomez. This type of affective and relationship difficulties occur more in neurotics and depressives. Both Gaona and Gomez focused their attention on the strange family of Juan Carlos. Two of his brothers who, like him, live with their parents, have been cloistered in the house for years, according to the neighbors. The day of Juan Carlos's funeral they caused amazement, especially one of them, with his long hair, his bushy beard and his eyes apparently far from reality. The mother of the clan had no objection to the disturbing relationship and she had no qualms in defining the crime as madness of love. That isolation and that apparent hostility can almost be a trademark of the house, says the psychologist. Gaona does not rule out a possible genetic factor in these apparently unusual behaviors. He felt betrayed by the girl. That's why he killed her, concludes the forensic psychiatrist. A host of circumstances came together. He believed that he was betraying him by aligning himself with the position of her mother, that she had been harassing him for months and reproaching him for the relationship. And he surely thought that he would make a fool of himself if Almudina went out with a boy her age. She didn't take it. Well, we have reached the end of this disturbing story. We hope that despite the seriousness of the case, it has been an enriching episode full of learning, which reminds us of the importance of communication, protection and care in family relationships and personal. We would like to take this opportunity to wish everyone who is about to embark on their well-deserved vacation a time filled with joy, rest and, of course, safety. Enjoy every moment, recharge your batteries and come back to us ready to continue unraveling the most fascinating cases in the history of crime. We want to especially thank our viewers from Spain, Mexico, and all other Spanish-speaking countries in South America for their continued support. Your presence and your comments make this journey even more exciting and rewarding. We feel truly grateful and lucky to be able to share these stories with all of you. Remember that your contributions and suggestions are always welcome, as they help us to improve and grow. So do not hesitate to share your ideas, questions or impressions about the cases we present. For now, it's time to say goodbye. But don't worry, we'll be back soon with a new episode in our favorite section, La Criminotica. Until then, take care of yourselves, and always remember, crime doesn't rest, and neither do we. Until the next episode, friends. See you.